Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon for this announcement. Before I begin, uh, I am aware that we have nameplates in front of us, but the description of who everyone is here and who they represent uh, is rather small. So, um, skipping over the minister, I will ask um, uh, those who are at the table today, perhaps we start with quick introductions. Uh, so everyone has an, has an idea of who's represented. I'll start uh, yeah, immediately on my our host, Katie. I'm Katie Bills, the President of the Federated Farmers. I'm um, Andrew Morrison, Chair of Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Neil Baker, Chair of the Rural Support Trust National, National Council. Jim Baker, Chair of DOEMZ. Fiona Gow, National President for Rural Women New Zealand. And can I just check, everyone can hear adequately, everyone at the table as well? And look, I acknowledge, um, I acknowledge that Nathan Guy has joined us as well for this um, announcement and discussion. Questions to follow, but I'll start, um, then I'll move to um, other representatives to give their introductory comments and then we'll move to questions. Cabinet has today uh, joined with industry and collectively decided to attempt the eradication of the cattle disease Mycoplasma bovis from New Zealand. We've made this decision in partnership with our farming sector to protect our national herd and the long-term productivity of our economic base. This was a tough decision and I empathise fully with those farmers going through the pain of losing their herds. We essentially had three options in front of us today. Phased eradication, long-term management, or doing nothing. Our plan to eradicate Mycoplasma bovis over time will require significant resources from both government and the industry, but to not act would cost even more. Cabinet today agreed with a decision that was essentially indicated by industry last week on a phased eradication plan that all up could cost $886 million, paid for in partnership between government and industry. Of this, $870 million is the cost of the response, including compensation, and there will be an estimated $16 million cost to the industry due to lost production as well. To not act at all is estimated to cost the industry $1.3 billion in lost production over a 10 year period, with ongoing productivity losses across our farming sector. This does not include the unquantifiable cost of what allowing the disease to remain in New Zealand would have on the well-being of our rural communities. Likewise, long-term management would have meant farmers throughout New Zealand we're faced with the uncertainty and the anxiety of whether this disease would appear in their herds. That is why we've made the decision to attempt eradication. I personally do not want to look back on this time, having seen the full impact of this disease on the productivity of our farming sector and the well-being of our rural communities and say, I wish we had tried harder. This is an ambitious plan to attempt eradication, and we will reassess as uh, partners together, government alongside industry, to ensure that we are on track. It is in the national interest of our country to be free of mycoplasma bovis. We regularly see the difficulty faced by farmers overseas when they find in bovis in their herds. It is heartbreaking. The social and economic impacts are too large to ignore, and I know some of those countries openly express regret that they too did not try to eradicate this disease. We have this one shot to eradicate, and we are taking it together. I'll hand over now to um, our Minister of Agriculture and Biosecurity to make a few comments. Um, sure, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank my cabinet colleagues and industry leaders um, for making the hard call today uh, to attempt uh, eradication, which is the right decision. Uh, it's a tough call. As a former share milker and farmer, uh, I can relate to the terrible situation facing anyone who has to 
cull their herd. I know there will be farmers who debate this decision. I've had calls and emails from some saying cull the herds and others saying stop the culling. It's really tough on the families who are directly in the firing line of this uh, terrible disease. Um, it's up to us to work together and to support them. The reason we're doing this is that farming is our single biggest export earner and the livestock part of it, uh, the biggest chunk of that. We need to protect that export earning capacity in our country. We have one shot at eradication to protect more than 20,000 dairy and beef farms across our country, but only if we act now. Can I say that uh, mass culls are necessary, unfortunately, because there's no clear, reliable test for identifying a single animal that is infected with the disease. The chances are that if one animal in the herd has it, then the rest of the herd can be infected. We are undertaking phased eradication, and just to run through a few of the points there, uh, culling all cattle on all affected properties along with cattle on most restricted properties will occur. All infected farms found in the future will also be depopulated. These farms will remain in lockdown. Following depopulation, our farms are in dis disinfected and will lie fallow for 60 days, after which time they can be restocked and farming can recommence. There will be active intensive surveillance across the livestock sector for the next 10 years. I'd just like to acknowledge all those farmers who have been affected uh, by this to date. There are some very generous and kind people who are facing some very difficult times uh, and, and our heart goes out to them. Can I say there will be some flexibility for the farmers uh, in the timing and culling to offset production losses and to allow them to work through this difficult situation. Can I say that um, biosecurity is absolutely important for our country. This is a wake-up call for us all. We're working through a process of upgrading our biosecurity system, improving our national animal identification and tracing system, making sure that uh, they are more user friendly uh, and more effective to enable us to better trace stock into the future. Can I just say in, in final um, comments that farmer welfare is at the forefront of everything we're thinking about. There are some farmers and families who are facing some severe stress. We want to encourage everyone who knows one of these people who lives in a rural community to get out there and support those people. Together we can get through this hopefully eradicate this disease and move on uh, to a better farming future. But thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Yeah, this has been the toughest week this last week to be faced with making this decision. Uh, being part of it has been an excruciating experience. But it was always uh, from the start of the whole process that while it looked like the science said that there was possibly eradication, we backed that thought all the way through that eradication was where we needed to go. We still believe that getting rid of it is the preferred option. You know, living with this is hard. We've seen what happens overseas, and we've seen all the rhetoric and all the other bits and pieces around it. But at the moment, being able to have a crack and offer compensation is key. And this is one of those times when you've got to take that call and have a crack. We're after looking after the whole of New Zealand's herd, and unfortunately it means that there's less than 45 of a percent that are going to have to um, take a for the rest of us. We're going to wrap around some really good support around our farmers who are going to go through this. This is a tough time. The pain and anguish they're going to go through is, is really hideous. And we have to support them as neighbours, community leaders, farmers, friends and so on. And our focus is going to be to continue on to make sure that they get that support and make sure that the system provides the compensation quickly and adequately and all those things to make this as easy a process as it can be, given it's such a difficult process. Okay, Andrew Morrison, Chairman of Beach New Zealand. Uh, there's been multiple references to this has been a really tough decision. As a Southland farmer, I live in one of these communities, and I'm aware of the impact on the responses that farmers in all the affected regions around New Zealand. 
farmers are affected are under huge restrict under movement restrict restrictions. They're under huge pressure and uncertainty. But that uncertainty and anxiety spreads much wider than those directly affected, right across the rural communities. So our goal with Beef and Lamb was New Zealand that we always believed to have the right information in front of the people will lead them to the right decision, and that's what's brought us here today. It is a decision that could have gone either way, but in the end the key thing was that eradication is only on the table for a limited time. And once it's off the table, it's off the table forever. We have a window of opportunity here. For beef and lamb, it's fundamentally important and a close decision to have some clear trigger points going forward to make sure the course of action we're following continues to make sense. This will be a key part of planning moving forward and our hope is that with the united effort, the difficult challenge of eradication can be met. Then we can turn our work to the crucial work of ensuring that we learn everything we can from this response that makes us better prepared for the future. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Neil Bader, Rural, uh, Rural Support Trust. <coughs> There's been a focus, and rightly so, on the disease, the farm, farms and the animals that are a really important part as the people. As some of the earlier speakers have noted, there is a lot of pressure and stress on people. Any disease eradication or control program is very stressful and it takes a toll on the people involved, farmers, share lookers, the managers, the farm staff. The Rural Support Trust is a totally independent organisation which can supply free and confidential support to individual farmers as required. MPI has supplied the contact deals of all details of all the farms under um, some form of restriction due to the program in place, and we've been supporting them through the process. And I have to say that the, the team in the South Island have been doing a great job down there. It's important that all farmers and uh, support those that are affected by no fault of their own, because those farmers are taking a hit on behalf of all farmers. So it's important that we get around them and support them. As a dairy farmer myself, and as a representative of all dairy farmers in New Zealand, this decision represents hope that as a country we might be able to eradicate this disease. We believe it is possible to eradicate because our experts are telling us that it is. And we have one chance to do so. We do not want to regret not taking that chance. Our decision to continue to eradicate is about ensuring that the 99 plus percent of farms and animals who don't have it, don't get it. And we will do everything we can to try and keep it out of those farms. But we have to acknowledge that there are farmers that are doing it hard and it is very personal for them. We are here to give those farmers the support that they need. I personally will continue to push hard to put the right support package around the people that need it. We need to undertake that someone, whether it's from DRNZ, MPI, or one of the other sector groups standing here today or sitting here today, will be driving up the driveway of any of the directly affected farms in the ne next week to give them support. Whether it's to help fill out forms, get access to feed, management plans, or just someone to talk to or get advice from. We're here to help those affected farmers. We have one chance to try and get this right, and we believe we should take that chance. It is vital now, as we push towards phased eradication, that we all apply on-farm biosecurity measures, complete NAIC, and access the information we need to make good decisions. There is a range of rumours at the moment I encourage farmers to talk to one of many farming groups, including DRNZ, to get the answers to the questions. I thank the government and all the other farming groups here today who have worked closely together to bring on a way forward for New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora Rural Woman New Zealand has been a leader in supporting rural communities since 1925, and we are here today in collaboration with the government MPI and the industry leaders to support our rural communities, the farmers, their families and especially the women and children through the tough times ahead. We are committed to ensuring there is wraparound welfare support for those affected because we understand that without this,
high stress of high levels of stress in times of any crisis and in the aftermath can lead to a breakdown in our rural social fabric. The last thing we need is the bullying of our children, an increase in family violence, or even suicide. Rural Women New Zealand will be working with the Rural Support Trust, other primary industry groups and leaders to ensure that all rural communities, all farmers and farming families, and the women and children feel connected and supported. Strategic, thoughtful and regular communication between the support networks and the communities is vital. Together we can do this. Thank you everyone. We'll now open um, up for questions. We'll try and direct questions to the most appropriate people to give you an answer. How concerned are you, Prime Minister? How concerned are you that this might fail? Well, of course, we're taking this opportunity because this is our one opportunity. Uh, of course, we know that there is no impact on human health. We know other countries uh, exist with this disease, but we want New Zealand to be free of it. And this is our opportunity to be that country. Why do you what? say that we have this one shot? What, what's the reason behind that? The longer that we leave it, the more difficult it becomes to eradicate. What makes you think it's going to be different to other countries in terms of trying to eradicate this? Of course, our borders in particular make it possible. Uh, we do believe that we're um, taking it on at a point that it is possible to eradicate. And as has been said, you know, more than 99% of farms uh, don't have it. We want to protect them from having it. So we are at a point where it is possible for New Zealand to be that country, and we have had a history of eradication of other issues, biosecurity issues before. I think also the cooperation between us all only strengthens our ability uh, to be the country who, who is able to eradicate. Um, can I just say that so far there's only one strain identified, mm -hmm. and we believe that that's come from one source. So if we can track and trace all the animals, we believe we can contain and then eradicate. So all the indicators are that this is possible to eradicate. Uh, experts have said so, and we believe we have to give it a go. What about the risk of reinfection? The risk of reinfection um, is, is dependent on, on the biosecurity systems that we run. Uh, we're certainly more alert um, to our biosecurity risks at the border uh, through the importation of, of people, of goods, uh, we're upping the game at every level and now I'm sure anyone involved in the farming sector will be very conscious of anything uh, that they import or, or consider a risk material. But there is a chance of oh, well, look, Other countries have had this, Ireland's had this since 1919, we've been free of it. So once we eradicate, we have the ability to uh, make sure that we maintain a standard. Will you be calling on any overseas bodies or any overseas experts to help you with this? We already, we already have. The technical advisory group was made up of overseas experts. Whereabouts were they from? Uh, those countries that have experienced Ireland, Australia, US. Ireland, Australia from the US. What was their advice? That it was still possible to eradicate. You would say that this is... You would, what was the cause of this or an aggravating factor was that farmers didn't comply with NAIC for years. I think the figure was given like only 70% 70, 70 of farmers didn't do that. What improvement has there been in NAIC compliance since? And are there still farmers who don't bother? Uh, look, we're working through um, 23 recommendations from the Independent Review Committee. Um, they will be implemented as quickly as we can. Uh, the rest of them, up to the 38, will be uh, implemented as we change legislation. The awareness and of the value of NAIT has up substantially. I have to say there wouldn't be a farmer in the country now that doesn't appreciate the value of NAIT, and I'm sure they're doing their very, very best to comply. So, so the NAIT has been a failure, though, and I mean, why are the NAIT boards still there? I mean, NAIT board have had a lot of time to get this together. Nothing's happened. I mean, we've got a failure. I, I can't explain why in history. Uh, all I'm saying is that we're going to get on and make the changes necessary. So the change is going to be get rid of the board and get a new lot of Look, you know, at the moment, moment, we're tackling this issue head on. Our focus is collectively working together to tackle uh, Microplace Bovis. We'll be working to make sure that all of the instruments we need to, uh, in place to manage it appropriately are there. Uh, when it comes to addressing wrongs of the past, that time will come, but for now, we've got to get on with it. This so is future requirements be more likely Yes. Prime Minister, this is a... Uh, I said earlier um, that 126,000 cows is what they expect, their livestock is expected to be held over this period. And over 10 years. That's a rough estimate over yeah. 10 years. And that the spring testing would likely um, create an increase in the number of farms and stuff that have been infected. Is there a 
there a cutoff point for you in terms of how many livestock with livestock with the cow where you would say that's that we're not going to carry on with this thing? Look, I'll, I'll actually I'll ask one of the um, industry members, but just to put that into perspective, so um, at the moment we're talking about the potential of 126,000 over a 10 year period. Um, in any given year, we might have a million dairy uh, dairy cows as part of dairy farming. So there is the ability to manage that within our national herd and manage it appropriately. Uh, but of course, we want to keep reflecting as government and industry together as we work through the eradication plan as to whether or not, for instance, after spring we see additional um, properties, additional strains, we'll analyse all of the evidence we have and continue to monitor it together. Uh, and we'll do that at regular intervals. And that's the key, understanding if those 126 are still traceable to the originals and so on like that. We've got multiple uh, avenues like that that will be getting that information through and making those decisions jointly as we go. But what you're saying is as long as they're still part of that same connection point, then you will be prepared to continue to power cows up until up until any number basically. It's the start of the theory at the moment. Prime Minister, obviously this is the cheapest of the three options that you've outlined before us today, but you say that other countries have lived and do live with this disease. Is there a reason, apart from the relative cost, that you want New Zealand to be free from EMBO? Do you know, I have to say, yeah, of course, you know, you're interested in the cost-benefit analysis, but, you know, I think from our collective um, discussions, the thing we want to ensure is that we don't allow something to continue that could have an unknown effect on our productivity down the track. And we don't know in the long term what impact it could collectively have on an industry that is incredibly important to New Zealand's economy. So if we have an opportunity to be the country that eradicates this disease, then we'll take it. Of the 152,000 cows um, we culled, how many of them... Over 10 years. Over 10 years. Of the 152,000 cows that will be culled, how many of them do you expect will be healthy cows? Can I say there'll be probably quite a large number of them are healthy. Um, um, the point was made to me that the majority of animals that we do um, cull uh, in New Zealand are all healthy. Um, this is a necessary, unfortunate part of not having yet uh, a test that clearly identifies the individual animals. If technology and development allows us to come up with that test or we get it from overseas, we'll be in a better position to be more selective about the cull. I think, I think the point that industry so clearly made is that, yes, in any given year, we might have a, a million cows culled as part of dairy farming in New Zealand. Uh, but that's spread across your national herd. What we're acknowledging today is that for some farmers, this will be their entire herd. So even though, as a proportion, it's a, it's a, it's a small number, that small number for an individual farmer will feel significant, but it is 1% of our, of our, our total farms in New Zealand, so just to give it that perspective as well. This is a pretty Sorry, big, Jim, can, Jim, I, make, can I make a comment? Because um, the cows might be healthy at the time, but remember if they carry in virus, it could come out any time. This is an animal welfare issue. And to wait for those animals to get sick before we do something about it is not right either. Point. What we know is if the herd has got in virus, then it's likely to come out of them at some stage. Yeah. So this is about trying to get in front of them. This is a pretty big budget hit for you, for the government. What options, other options, is it cutting out in other areas? Well, we've always acknowledged that we needed to make sure that we were prepared for a rainy day um, for issues just like that, those of national security, biosecurity. Uh, that's why you saw us deliver a, a budget that was prepared to deal with issues like this. Will you so have to change? Ninety million will come directly out of your surplus. Uh, look, it's for the Minister of Finance to determine how it's accounted for, but I can tell you we were prepared for this. We prepared a budget that was able to carry the load of an incident like this. But the budget said uh, one of the risks to the forward projection was the impact of embovis. I mean, it hadn't been equated yet, so you're going to have to change those numbers, aren't you? Uh, as I say, James, we delivered a surplus for the very reason that we wanted a buffer for a rainy day. This is a rainy day. Just on those figures, you got 68% coming from government, 32% coming from industry. How did you uh, arrive at that split? Um, that's based on GIA principles. You know, we've, um, we've worked with the government to see what would be fair and equitable and based on the, um, what we've agreed. The whole principles around the government industry uh, agreement is what we're going to use going forward. Was there much negotiation in that, or was that just the first figure that you arrived at? Oh, no, we just sat down together and we decided what we thought was fair and equitable and the right thing to do. 
Uh, that's obviously something that we MPI is directly pursuing and we have an expectation that they will pursue uh, those who may have been involved with the original arrival of MBOVIS in New Zealand. You can see the impact that it's had. Uh, again, um, that's something that's happening in tandem. We're very focused on eradication, but that work uh, is underway. Uh, there's a range of ways that it could have come in. Uh, I would not, uh, again, I wouldn't want to prejudice uh, uh, any further investigation, but uh, uh, as I say, MPI are working on it. Has the operations have the response shaping your confidence in MPI? Was that for me or the Minister? Uh, both. Uh, no, look, this is a brand new challenge uh, for an organisation that has huge responsibilities. Um, no other country has done this. Um, we haven't had a standing army, army waiting around for this, so uh, at every level we have been challenged. There might be in hindsight mistakes that were made, but we're upping the level of resource, the level of capability, and working with industry organisations um, um, to improve our support for farmers and our, and our action. The decision today will enable us to move on in a more certain way uh, to, to uh, indeed eradicate the possible. Excuse me, do you have a industry is paying 32%, how much would that work out per farm on average? No, no, we don't. Um, obviously that's an issue that we're leaving with industry. Um, what I will say is that that won't, um, uh, that won't delay the work around the eradication plan. We were planning to pursue that um, and obviously government funding will allow us that to happen immediately and then industry will work through on their side of the ledger how they operationalise the 32%. Talked a lot about this one one shot at eradication. Should that one shot have been taken in July last year when, when this disease was first discovered? Look, you know, we could talk about um, July last year when it was discovered. We could talk about uh, 2015 when there's some view that that may have been the entry point. Our job is to take responsibility now together for the eradication plan moving forward. That's what we're doing. We've given insurance that, that farmers will receive a substantial amount of money of their compensation within 10 days, thereabouts, from their claim when it's put in. Um, uh, it, it's a complicated process to ensure uh, or to calculate accurately the loss of milk income, uh, but in terms of the loss of their cows, that's a far simpler process, and we've committed to speed up that process to ensure that no one is squeezed financially um, through their, their part in this whole process. Look, the farmers will receive a meat check um, from the meat companies and then there's the balance uh, based on a, a fair valuation of their animals uh, and then any potential loss of income from milk uh, or other sources of income that they might have had from the animals. So uh, it, it's not simple, but MPI have committed to speed up the process to ensure that people aren't squeezed unfairly. Look, oh, last question. What was that, sorry? Well, we have to have a fair process to all parties, fair to the taxpayer as well as to the farmers. Oh, yeah. and, and, as, and as, as Jim would say, there's standards in there. We know what the, the natural attrition rate and cull rate is, and I know earlier on, speaking to our MPI, there was allowances made for that part of the process. So it's going to be pretty standard. But we're going to wrap it. I'm going to allow. Um, uh, industry representatives, if there's anything that I'd like to finally add. Probably nothing to add with really, the stage I think we've covered it pretty well. It's, uh, as you can see, I guess, from the, from the whole group, you know, we're united and this is the right decision to make and the just right thing to do going forward. Have you to do anything finally? Uh, look, just that we are really conscious of those people now who we've got to look after and all this, <coughs> and we're going to make sure that we can do our best there, and actually that they need to reach out as well if they feel like it's not enough help, and let us know so we can do more. Okay, well, I'm going to do a stand up now, so if you've got any additional questions, I can carry the those in there. Industry the question the 32% that is um, the picked up by industry, yes. will that only be borne by the affected farms or by the no, industry as a whole? It's an industry. Okay, good um, I'll now stick around for any additional.
non-bogus questions you might have, we might do that in the session, but thanks for your time.